It's good to be back with each, each and every one of you. As we continue in the book of Acts, in the eighth chapter, I want us to see what happened after Stephen is, is killed. He's stoned to death. In verse eight, or chapter eight, verse one, we begin to see that the church scatters. I remember being asked by some kids several years ago, some questions that I really wanna ask each of you just to think about for a time. If I sold my house and my car, had a big garage sale and gave all my money to the church, would I go to heaven? The kid said, no. I said, if I cleaned the church every day, mowed the yard, kept everything neat and tidy, would I go to heaven? Again, they answered no. Well, I continued, I said, then how can I get into heaven? One of the kids said, well, you gotta be dead. You have to die. There was an estimation that was made that caught my attention. It says that it takes 1,000 lay persons and six ministers to lead one person to Christ in a year. It was also estimated that 95% of the Christians today have never led anyone to Jesus Christ. See, this is complete reversal of Jesus' strategy of the New Testament evangelism that was occurring there in Acts. These things gotta change if we're gonna reach the world. The world we live in today, the one thing I can guarantee you that the world needs is Jesus, is Savior. So what does it mean to be a church and to really serve the Lord? What's that mean? Have we just taken our faith to be something that we use to outrun sin, that we try to ignore the outside world? You know, it's interesting. You have Christians who want to be just like the world and blend in. And then you have Christians who want to be separate and away from the world. And they just want to hide in their, in their churches or their houses and do their thing and avoid real life. So how do we reach out to our friends, our family, our neighbors? How do we reach out to them? As we see in our text tonight, being a scattered church maybe isn't a bad thing. Maybe being a scattered church is actually what God has intended. You go, well, what do you mean by that? I've read these verses over and over and over again many times. And I have be came to a conclusion. We have become a scattered church but not in the way that our text talks about. To scatter means to throw loosely around or to throw loosely about. And see, I believe that this is the problem of the church. We're not focused. We've allowed the, this virus, all the politics, all the things going on during this time to cause us to, to lose our focus on what the calling of the church truly is. We as Christians have got so wrapped up in all the things of the world that we've forgotten that Jesus came to this world and became sin on the cross so that this world wouldn't, people in this world wouldn't leave this earth without him as Savior and that they would suffer eternal punishment. That's why he came. Oftentimes we allow all these other things that cause us to lose the focus of what the church should be. I want us to see the ideal of being the scattered church 
from a different perspective. We see in Acts that as the people are being persecuted, they scattered and people begin to go all over the parts of the world that, that were being inhabited. And they were going, and as they were being spread out across the world, they begin to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever they were. It's no different today. See, they weren't scattered as far as just chasing the world. They were scattered because of the persecution, but God used them and was able to reach more people because there were Christians spread out instead of being just in specific parts of the world and just being centered around Jerusalem. They began to be scattered. In Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it says, And Saul approved of their killing him. They're speaking of Stephen. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women, put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks and pure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. The first thing to be a scattered church means that we must leave our comfort zone. You know, when you move, you go to a new city, you go to maybe a new job, you move to a new house, all of those things, it's tough. Especially when God says move, you don't really know what you're gonna do when you get to wherever he sends you. See, we like to have a plan. We like to know exactly what we're going to do, but sometimes God works that out in a way that we don't know the plan until the last second. I've seen that happen with several of my family recently, and they've just had to trust God that they were following him, and although they didn't know the plan, that they trust God's plan was going to be a great and perfect plan for them. And that's what happened to these Christians. See, they had to leave what they knew. Many of them left their homes that they had been at for a long time. Many of them left jobs, left, left some of their family. And they were going not just to get away from the persecution, but to start over somewhere. Start somewhere where they wouldn't be persecuted for their faith. But when they got there, they didn't just show up. They preached the word of God. They told others about the saving power and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. Back in Acts chapter six, verse two, we see that Philip had been called to wait on tables. Many times we think of this as one of the guys that was, that was the apostle, but actually this Philip was one of them that was chosen as a deacon, as a table waiter. And we see because of his faithfulness and that of the, the apostles, that it says, the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. That was in chapter six. And see, that would have been enough for me but in Acts 8, 26, it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now remember, he's being faithful. He's going, he's preaching the word wherever God sends him. Remember, one of his fellow deacons, Stephen, has just been stoned to death. 
And it says that people, the Christians scattered except for the apostles. Everyone else scattered. And now we just read in verse 26 that God is telling Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. He's just going to a road. He doesn't know what to expect when he gets there. He doesn't know if he keeps walking down the road. He's just been given this one direction. I thought about a movie that I haven't seen in a really, really long time. I think most people, at least my age, have seen this movie. Not all, but most. But there is a film made about the Titanic. And many of us know from history that over 1,500 of the 2,200 passengers on that, on that great ship, they died. This happened on April 15th, 1912. It's been a long time ago, over 100 years ago. You know, the greatest tragedy of that story and the history of that is most of those people shouldn't have died. They didn't have to die. They could have been saved. See, there were 20 lifeboats and a lot of people climbed into them. But most of those lifeboats were only half full. Now think about that. They had 20 lifeboats. And as the ship was sinking, they were only half full. There were hundreds of people that had life preservers and they got in the water and almost every single one of them died, but they didn't die from drowning. They died from freezing to death. The people in those lifeboats, they heard the people that were dying, they were crying out, but they were afraid to go back. And so they didn't. There was one lifeboat out of the 20 that went back, but it was too late. They say that out of the hundreds of people that were in the water, only six people were rescued. That's a sad story. But when we think about it, as Christians, as we're scattered and as the church is scattered out, the body of Christ is scattered out, God's given us more territory, more people, more ministry. But if it doesn't break our hearts that there are people around us who are literally dying every day, that we could lift up Jesus to, and it'd be like those lifeboats that were just half full of filling them all the way up. Many people would be saved. Oftentimes when we get put in a new situation, we just try to survive. We just try to figure out how to make it work for us, for our family, for our little group of people. But there's many who are dying. In Acts chapter 8, verse 27, it says, So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. The second thing to be the scattered church means that we must be led by the Holy Spirit. Philip had no idea God's plan for him there, but he was faithful to go where he was told to go. You know, during this this time of COVID-19, you look all over the world, look over our country. There are many, many, many large churches 
in our nation that have just closed down. It's just easier that way than to try to figure out how to do services with half the amount of people, all the logistics, all the things they have to do. And so they've just depended on the internet. We'll put it on the online and that'll just have to be good enough. Now, I'm not speaking for any other pastor or any other church because I don't know what God has told him to do. And if God has told him to do that, then amen. But if we're just taking the easy way out or the way that we don't have to spend as many hours, maybe the way that costs a little more time, a little more money, if we're not willing to do that just because we don't want to, there's a problem. See, at Bel Air, in that building, there has been Bel Air and two Spanish mission churches that have been meeting there. Our, one of our pastors lost his job in the oil field, and so now he is a rancher, a farmer, and he's working in a completely different city. It's still in our county, but it's a lot further away from Hobbs. It's over an hour drive to the church every time they drive with them and their family just to go to the church. Our other pastor lives in Eunice, which is probably about 20 miles away, and his main some of his main workers in the church are in Lovington. So during this time, we have found ourselves spread out instead of being all in Hobbs, we were spread out all over the county. And for one of our congregations, they've had many that uh, are unwilling to go because they're scared. There's others that want to go on their terms, and so they're not going. And what has happened is no one has, has been attending that service. And so God put it on their hearts They've been praying and praying and praying and God put it on their hearts to instead of having two services a week in the building, they are now going to individuals' houses and ministering in different cities. They're also doing online, they're doing Facebook Live, they're doing many, many things they've never done. And they're busy every single day. But what we have found is from three small congregations that are met in one building, all of a sudden we're all spread out and we're ministering more than we ever have. And not a single pastor at our church receives pay. Not one. We're all volunteers. And it's amazing how many people in each congregation are volunteers. And we have all ministered not just to one another, but to people in the community. Because we've been led by the Holy Spirit. And every time God opens a door, then we go through that door, not knowing what's on the other side. It's easy to try to format and predict things. But if we're going to be the church that God has called us to be, we need to be led by the Spirit. The third thing to be the scattered church means that we must tell the story. Instead of explaining that, we're going to read it from the scripture and get these basic things that we need to do as Christians to tell the story. In verse 30, it says, And Philip, Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The first thing I want you to see is the question to ask. See, when the Holy Spirit leads us to approach someone, we should not be afraid. You may go, well, I don't know the Bible well, or I'm afraid to talk to people I don't really know. I don't like strangers. I'm not good at this. I'm not a pastor like you, or I'm not a teacher or a deacon. I'm not good at these sort of things. That's not what Philip said. Now remember, he's not been a deacon very long. And God is already using him 
in a time where deacons are being killed. And yet he runs up to the chariot. Why did he run? Because he was in a hurry to do what God had called him to do. And this, this important person is reading from the book of Isaiah. And Philip just simply asked the right question. Do you understand what you're reading? You notice this man says, how can I understand unless someone explains it to me? See, he could read it, but he didn't understand it. And all Philip asked was a question. We too can do the same thing. You know, people have asked, how can you have hope or peace or joy in these times when the world is, is fighting a virus that is killing many people? It's changed the way we live. It's changed how, how people make a living. How can you have hope in this time? We need to ask the right question. How can you have hope? How can I have hope in these times? They, they need the answer. They want the answer. And they can read scripture. But we need to ask the right questions. In verse 32, it says, this is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The next thing is the scripture to read. What scripture do you use? Now I will tell you that we live in a time that if you just quote Bible verses at people, that's not going to help them. You go, well, why not? Well, it's because there are so many religions out there that people understand now. Every religion has its own book. And you go, well, yeah, but our book is right. Well, I would tell you that Muslims would say the same thing about the Quran. Buddhists would say the same thing about the writings of Confucius. I mean, we could go through all of these things and every religion has their own book and they believe that their book, their book is the only correct one. So how do we use scripture? Because it says that we should use scripture. God's word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, right? It shows us how to go. So we use scripture through just speaking the words. We don't go in, in Acts chapter 8, verse 32, it says, no, but we do say the scripture that I believe says, or we just tell them what it says. And they go, well, where did you hear that from? It's from the Bible. It's from God's word. Notice that the Holy Spirit of God led this man to read the scripture about Jesus who was prophesied about from Isaiah, who was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And he was silent. He didn't open his mouth about it. He was humiliated. He was deprived of justice. His life was taken. What a perfect scripture. See, the Holy Spirit chose the scripture. And it was the right one. This is why it's so important, Christians, that we study God's word, that we read it. We read it every day. And we study and we meditate upon it. We think about it. Because it is this that we need to be able to recall. And when we've studied and read it, the Holy Spirit will give you that, that verse that you need to recall. He'll give you that thing that you need to say. That you, you'd be surprised how much of scripture that you probably 
remember and have memorized. Because the Holy Spirit will give you exactly what you need at that time. In verse 34, it says, The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. We also, when we tell the story, it's the truth to explain. See, this man needed to know, was, was Isaiah talking about himself? Was he talking about someone else? And Philip took that very passage of scripture that God had given him, and he told him about the good news about Jesus. See, he explained to them that that prophecy from Isaiah had been fulfilled through Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ had given his life for us. He had became sin on the cross. A perfect man became sin on the cross for us, and he died. And on the third day, he was resurrected from the dead. See, the man read the prophecy from the Old Testament, and Philip used that very prophecy to explain to him who had fulfilled that prophecy and how he fulfilled it. I saw a quote that was really interesting to me. It's a quote, I get a lot of sermon quotes and things every single day. This one was actually from an atheist. He asked a question that's really been bugging me all week. He said, if you truly believe that there is a person who can give you eternal life in a perfect place, if you truly believe that, how much do you have to hate someone not to tell them? Have you ever thought about that? This is from an atheist, a person who believes in no God, no afterlife, none of that. And he has said, you must really hate somebody a lot if you have the key to eternal life that you say you do. You must hate them a lot if you won't tell them about it. Now we can not like that comment but there's a lot of truth to the comment. See, this eunuch, he needed the truth. I want to finish the sermon by showing you what happened with this man. In verse 36, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stand in the way Am I being baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. What an interesting thing to happen. They're traveling. Remember in the Great Commission, go you therefore into all the world, preaching the gospel. It also says to baptize them, to disciple them. And we see here that Philip got the great honor to lead this man to the Lord. And as they're traveling, there's some water. And this eunuch, he says, hey, there's some water right there. 
I could be baptized. And Philip does something really interesting. Philip explains to him very quickly, well, do you believe? Because if you believe, you'll be baptized. Now, at this first moment, I believe the eunuch at first believed maybe the, the, the water baptism was what did it. But what Philip was talking about is that he was going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. He was going to be saved and he was going to receive the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. The physical baptism that Philip did, that's a first step of a new Christian. It's a example, it's a witness, it's a picture, it's a symbol of what has just happened. That person has been buried. That old person has been buried. And as they're brought out of the water, it symbolizes that they have, they have risen. They have been resurrected from the dead through the power of Jesus Christ. One of my favorite parts of baptizing people doesn't make sense to most people, even some pastors. My favorite part's not standing in the water, although I love standing there with that person. My favorite part's not as I put my hand up and I say something like, upon your confession of faith, your belief in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I baptize you, my brother or my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And I take him under the water and as I raise them up, I say, risen. Well, you know what my favorite part is? And almost every time, even after 22 years, I always add a little tears to the water. But my favorite part is, I say, risen to walk in a new way of life. And as they walk out of the baptistry, the people are clapping, they're cheering, they're, they're taking pictures, they're taking videos. What an awesome moment. But as they walk out, they are showing everyone that's there that they're walking out a new person because the old them is dead. And now the power of the Holy Spirit lives within them and they live a, a new life, an eternal life because of Jesus. And as they walk out into the world, wherever God may lead them, they walk out as a person who is now carrying God in their life. And the Bible says to be full of the Holy Spirit overflowing. That means when people see the overflowing love of God in the grace and the mercy, it will change them. It will change who they are forever. I bet Philip was wondering, this is going to be a busy ministry, isn't it, God? Because as soon as he brought this man up out of the water, God had already decided that his work right there was done. And it says, suddenly, it says, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again. The eunuch went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared in a completely different place, in Azutis. When he got there, I'm sure he was going, wow, that was quick. I went to a road that I didn't really know what to do from there. I got on a chariot. I went with a man I never met. I, I answered some questions from scripture. I led him to the Lord. I baptized him and boom, I'm out of here to the next ministry. As I talked this week to the pastor's wife, 
And she was explaining to me, Pastor, we're not meeting in the building right now. But we're still ministering. Pastor, we don't want you to think we have lost hope that we've given up, that we've quit, that we shut down the church. Because it's far from it. Pastor, we have two new families. And it looks like a third new family. And we're going to their homes and, and we're doing Bible study. And we're worshiping together. And pastor, we've never been so busy in all of our life. We're just ministering everywhere that God gives us an opportunity. You know, I know a lot of people would say that's not good enough because you need to meet in that building at that appointed time. But I told her, I said, you keep ministering in however and wherever and whenever God tells you to do so. There's a lot of ministry that happens that doesn't happen inside of a building. That ministry happens all over and it's wherever God places us is at that time. And so yes, at Bel Air, we're a scattered church. You know, I talked about the perfect scripture for the perfect time. I've been preaching this series from the very day that all of this COVID changed how we do church. This is the 17th sermon in this series. For 17 weeks, we've been doing church in a way that we never thought we would have to do. We're doing church in ways like me preaching to a video. I said 20 weeks ago, I would never do such a thing. And yet, I'm being faithful to what God has called me to do. Some people have said, well, there's only five or six people that view your sermons now because they can go back to the building. And that's true. But God must know that there's five or six people that they can't make it to that building. But he's leading them to listen to this sermon. We got to be faithful. And even though we're scattered out and we're doing things different and we're having to be six foot apart and we're masked and all these things, we still got to be the church. The church is the body of Christ. It's not just one group of people in a particular building. It's all Christians in this world. And we have to be the church, regardless of the circumstances or the situations we have been placed in. Don't act like God doesn't know what's happening. God knows exactly what's happening. And he has prepared his people for this time. We should be prepared to spread the gospel in whatever way God calls us and asks us to do. And he will tell us where to go and when to go and what to say. We just got to be willing to do it. I pray that we'd be the scattered church, a church that lifts Jesus Christ up to all the people that God puts before us, and that we would trust his Holy Spirit to give us the answers, the right scripture, and to give us the love and mercy and grace that only we could have through God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. An unusual time for us. We have become very programmed, very robotic at times in our ministries. We've never imagined ministry not being on a schedule or on a calendar or just being the way we structured it and planned it. We never imagined that. The Lord, in a, in a strange way to us, this is a blessing because we stop focusing on you and being the church that you've called us to be. And we just turn our Christian walk into ways to avoid sin and 
and to avoid this confrontation. We become lazy. We become apathetic, Lord. Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I pray that we would be the church, that we would be your army, that, Lord, that we be the body of Christ and that we would follow wherever he leads. Lord, I pray if anyone is listening to this and they're without you as Savior, that, Lord, you would send someone Maybe just do this video to show them the truth that you have died for us. You have resurrected from the dead and given us victory. And Lord, to you, we can have eternal life. It's in Jesus' name we pray.